Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. I've done oh, about 610 or 12 of them now. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Uh, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website. Um, my guest today is Clay Lomakayu Miller. Uh, Clay lives in Cottonwood, Arizona, just outside of Sedona, where he has been serving clients from all over the world to assist them in living at the center of the circle of who they are. Medicine of One is the outcome of this service. It's also the name of a book that I just finished reading. It is a non-dual sh shamanic path that has formed from his work with clients for 25 years and his time in the ancient sacred land of the Southwest. He uses a unique form of healing called soul dreaming to help free people from the stories from their past so they may gift the world their true presence. He is also the creator of primordial movements for trauma and emotional integration. He considers his primary service as the sharing of medicine of one. At his side are his wolf dog helpers, in other words, his dogs, assisting people with their presence and love. Medicine of One is summed up in the one noble truth, which is to live at the center where, from true being, comes our true doing. Um, the, the first action is the true action of self-love. So, that, that last thing I just read reminds me of the, a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which is established in being, perform action. So, welcome, Clay. Welcome. Yeah, I'm just doing uh, uh, Gandhi's, uh, according to uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita, according to Gandhi. Ah. Did, just did he do that. a um, commentary on it or something? Yeah, he did a short commentary while he was in jail. Oh, nice. And when you say doing, uh, what, you, what you're alluding to here is that you, you make your living these days by reading audiobooks and putting them up on audible.com. And, and you, you were just telling me you get to choose the book, so you just choose all these cool books you'd like to read, and you read them <laughs> out loud and get paid for it. And, yeah, and I have fun. That's the main yeah. thing. Uh, I, I don't read the book. I live Yeah, it. yeah. Oh, I know what you mean. You mean you, you just kind uh, of you, you tune into the wavelength of that book, right? Yeah. I never look ahead. I never read uh -huh. ahead. I don't know what's ahead yeah. of me. I just jump in and let it come through and try to imagine that there's somebody there that I'm talking to. Yeah, that's great. That I'm connecting uh. with. So that's my main uh, way that I do it. So I make a lot of mistakes that way, though. So then you just have to redo a passage? I have to do a lot of editing. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, you know, then, and that's the way I read your book, The Medicine of One. I, I listened to it while I was, you know, walking around in the park or washing dishes and things like that. And uh, that's how I read most every book I read these days. So, kind of kill two birds with one stone, you know, get some exercise and listen to a book. So, you were referred to us by um, the Reverend Bill McDonald, who's a good friend that we've interviewed a couple of times. And I guess you got to know him because you did an audio recording of one of his books. And uh, when we announced that we were going to interview you, a couple of people got in touch and, and they said, Wow, I, I really love this guy's YouTube channel. He has all these cool videos on it. And I actually haven't even much looked at your YouTube channel because I was so busy listening to your book. But we actually did get a question here. Might as well start with it from Mike Kapiler in Chilliwack, British Columbia, which is outside of Vancouver. He said, I really value your YouTube channel. It was my first introduction to Nisargadatta Maharaja's teachings. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for the time you took to make those audiobooks. Yeah, I'll keep reading his question here even though this is a little bit premature to ask, but I'll ask it. What is your experience with the Sargadatta Maharaj? How were you influenced by him? Well, that's where the whole aspect of shamanic non-duality comes from. Because very often sh shamanism actually can easily invoke duality. Different levels of worlds, different spirits. Um, and 
so it's it's that you know it's the whole i use a circle to talk about what it's very difficult to talk about which is who you really are your true presence so a circle is actually a sphere and it's you just here quiet not thinking so it's 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 space essentially it's spaciousness and so that is uh that is I am, essentially. And so Nizad Gadatta, unlike a lot of people, actually talks about going beyond I am, beyond the circle. And, uh, and but, but he discusses a lot of things. So it, to me, it's, I take in these books, I don't try to gather information or concepts. Uh, I absorb the teachings by living them, so to speak. And then they find their way into my work. Uh, and so, you know, I also have done a lot of the Ramana Maharshi. Uh, and uh, he doesn't talk as much about what's beyond I am. Um, but I am is the circle. And as you read in the introduction, for me to live at the center of the circle, who's center is nowhere and circumference is everywhere is the one noble truth. And so for me, many people read, read Nizad Gadatta and they stay on that level of just reading or listening and gathering concepts. And then there are some people that try very hard to, to, to do what he suggests you do and they have a very difficult time doing it because it means you need to live at the center of the circle. And so basically medicine of one is how to help people move to that center point. So in a way, medicine of one is everything that Nizar Gadatta does not talk about, <laughs> uh, which is like, you know, life, psychology, normal problems. Uh, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, those types of things, trauma, um, he, especially as he got older, he had no patience for anything but the absolute. Right. <clears throat> so. Yeah. There was also a, a quote that I had from him someplace. If I wanted to, I could take a minute to pull it up. But basically he said, forget I am that. I am that was the name of his book. He said, it goes so much deeper than that. I've realized so much more since then. He, he said that towards the end of his life. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, it, well, and the thing is, once you, it, to me, the only thing you can uh, practice or occupy is that that experience of being that the presence, the circle. Beyond that, you can't do anything. Um, I look at it as like dropping a pebble in the water, and your sense of I am is your separateness within that pool of water. But the absolute is beyond that. It dissolves. So you can't talk about it because there's nobody there to talk mm. about it. When you use the circle metaphor, um, could, we, could we envision, let's say, a, a bicycle wheel where there's the hub of the wheel and then there's all these spokes and most people are kind of stuck out on one spoke or another or they're kind of scattered among a bunch of spokes. That, that, in other words, the attention is fragmented and outer directed, whereas you're advocating kind of getting down to the hub from which all the all the spokes um, emerge, or and, and if, if you could, if you could live at the hub, then you'd kind of be at the center of everything, rather than and and therefore not at the mercy of um, the relative world. You'd kind of have a silent center or foundation uh, from which to live. Would that be a fair description? Yeah, yeah. That's and the so the difficulty is I look at those um, spokes of the wheel. Uh, the way I look at them is there, there are stories, there are uh, tendencies, there are habit, you know, and, and so they're what I call little eyes. And as we move through life, because everybody's surviving from the time they're little people, within the story are emotions. And the way we survive is not to let them move. And so they create a force, a spin, that is what pulls you out of the center. And most people's habit is to survive is to get rid of that. If I can get rid of that, then I'll be at the center. So everybody tries to throw out of the circle 
what they don't like within themselves, which sometimes could be, I want to be loved. <laughs> or their anger at not being loved or all kinds of feelings that we try to get rid of. And what they do is by the, the pressure of pushing them out, you actually allow them to pull you toward them. And so the medicine won by becoming the circle, which is that spacious presence, uh, Nizargadatta, only infrequently uses that sense of uh, awareness. He uses the word affection, affectionate awareness. And to me, that's what the circle is. It's affectionate awareness to everything that moves in the circle. So it lets it move and allows you then to free the energies that are trapped and liberate your gifts, which then by living at the center can come through you into the world. Sounds good. Yeah, I often think of people trying to push things out as being like people trying to push beach balls under the water, you know, and you have to apply all this effort and they keep trying to pop up and, <laughs> you know, it's kind of becomes a full-time occupation trying to keep them under the water. But what you're saying, I think, is allow yourself to experience these things and process them and then you won't expend all that energy trying to repress them and then you'll have tons more energy because they will have been resolved, hopefully. Also, what it does is, because when you push them away, they own you. You become them. You think that's who you are, because they have a point of view and a story that they believe that's what happened. So part of being the circle is to give up what you believe. Uh, mostly, you know, except hang on to the essential ones that I believe I'm greater than these spins, so to speak, or the desire to, you know, uh, I don't, I, I, I avoid using the word self-realization, but it's just, you know, to be, to live at the center, you know, and everything that comes from that. Um, but so it, it's, it's this thing of, we invoke the circle to become the circle. So with an emotion, many people try to process them mentally even though they're working with them, they're trying to allow them to move. The big thing for me is the vibration has to be brought into the physical presence. The vibration of the emotion that isn't just general. So uh, in the soul dreaming that you mentioned, it's a dream. Uh, first, I, know what, I wanna know what people want. What do you want? How do you wanna feel in the world? Do you wanna feel more trust? Do you wanna have freedom? Do you want to speak your truth, um, love? So that's a feeling. And so once I know what they want, I, I, that's the only thing I know. I'm gonna, a dream's gonna come through me, a journey that will help carry them to that. And the dream is full of vibrations that can be places, objects, people, and frequently sort of psychic material comes in where it looks like something that happened and I'm actually channeling it like a musical instrument. So that's where my voice comes in again. That's where the use of my voice came from. Uh, Cause I cry, I yell, I scream, I hit on words. So it's a journey through the vibrations. If they can live the journey with me, they will arrive at the end. And basically it's by being this sort of quiet, affectionate presence uh, and allowing themselves to be affected by the vibration. So they might shake, cry, tremble, laugh, but it's effortless. They're not trying to do anything. So that's a, that's a passive way. And the active way is I use a person's body and voice, which I call, for one of a better description, primordial movements. Can you think of an example as a case in point of someone you worked with where you did the soul dreaming and, you know, and how that went? And also, um, <clears throat> When you say it's a dream, do you mean a dream that you, Clay, have during sleep at night? Or is it more of an altered state in the waking state where you kind of, you know, channel some kind of knowledge that comes through? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> the person the person is present. So you're, si you're sitting with a person speaking. in a room or out in yeah. nature or something the like that? Well, I, uh, basically the best place is for me to do it in my home because nature becomes, it becomes different. Nature becomes part of it then. And it's more, it's more inward rather than nature oriented. 
Um, and I use music too, because it's another vibration. And so practically speaking, what happens is once I establish what they want, uh, in which case I actually use a circle. And in this case, the spokes are just the four directions and we establish what they want. And a person could use animals to describe those because those are just qualities that you want to bring in. And so then I, I take them into a deep state for about five minutes, slowly taking them down. I put my hands on, I start the music, put my hands on them. Whatever presents itself, that's what I go with. So I'm trusting that it will, what will come through me will be the right thing that will lead them to where we want to arrive at. And so frequently when, when that happens, it, can, it doesn't make any sense to my mind. It's not like it comes from something they told me. Um, that's why it is dreamlike. It can have sometimes a linear storyline, but um, it can often be very dreamlike. So I could start out, I could say, um, I could put my hands on somebody and what comes through is, mom. <laughs> and, and that's the beginning of a story right there. That's a big story, mom, <laughs> okay? So suddenly I sweep them back to a moment that somehow is sitting in them. And if they can let it move toward them and they can move toward it, then it will cause a reaction in them as they just be with it. Some of the time, most of the time, perhaps they know what it's about. It's like hitting the nail on the head sometimes, not always, they don't know, but sometimes they don't really have to know. And then by my letting it come through me, that's like grabbing a thread and I follow the thread. And I follow the thread by feeling each moment. It leads me to the next moment. And sometimes what comes in is a stubbornness inside them. Uh, they, they, there's a, always a part of many people that uh, they're there because they want something and they want to grow. But there's another stubborn part that's connected to their survival and control. And it doesn't want to. And that's really the problem, that part. Because it's it sort of uh, controls. It keeps them away from the emotion. It causes them to think all the time, and so, it, and that's sort of what we're trying to do. Is these unmoved emotions energize the thinking? So rather than try to grapple with the thinking and show that mind a different point of view and talk it out of what it feels, I go down below it to what's driving it to dissipate that so that it's no longer energizing it. But at the same time, I always tell people, but you must give up what you believe, <laughs> uh, which many times is you must give up being right. Yeah, and I presume you're meaning things like, uh, not that you, you shouldn't believe the earth is a globe and, and not flat, but ra rather, I, you know, someone might think, well, I'm a loser, I'm a jerk, you know, I'm a, a bad person, I'm a, you know, that kind of negative stuff about themselves, and you're asking them to give up that kind of, those sort of things? Yeah, that's, that's more on the surface. Um, take somebody that's been traumatized, victimized, they have to give up the belief in their victimhood, even though it looks like that. I know um, you have this whole it, victim and, warrior polarity that you yeah. talk about. Yeah, the, the, the way I look at it is people, those are the two ways that we survive uh, or people do uh, sort of jump back and forth. So uh, the, the, the victim becomes uh, completely owned by the energy. So frequently they can't stop talking about it. They don't like the feeling. They do. They also want to get rid of it. The warrior, in a sense, the true warrior never talks about it. They make a good soldier. They don't make a good husband when they come back home, though, <laughs> yeah. because they're so disconnected from that world. And they're very difficult people to work with because emotion is a language they don't even know. And uh, I'm trying to 
tell them, look, uh, I know everything you've done to survive is not letting this in. But now if you want to go beyond that, you must let this in. <laughs> and here's the core, the most difficult, but to me it is the relationship to powerlessness. If you can actually soften and feel the energy of powerlessness, but remember, you're the circle feeling it. You're not the powerlessness. So that's where you give up your belief. You give up by identifying yourself as the circle, as spaciousness, as presence, which is as simple as when I go, mom, okay, that energy comes into me and I just, I, I do it. And then I suddenly, I just step into feeling the space around me. I go, mom, and I take a breath and I feel the space and I just let it come in. And it sort of rushes through me. And to me, it's always opposites. It, it's, there's always an opposite. Well, to me, everything exists because of opposites. So um, if there's a mom, there's a, say that mom is like, could even go as far back as an infant laying in their back in a crib and it's dark and cold and nobody's there. And that, that story plays out for their whole life. And they grow up and they might even be 50 years old and still that mom's inside of them. And they're still angry with mom. And they still play out the dynamic. Because mom, what they believe about the story is mom didn't love them. <laughs> and so, um, so the mom is one movement, but the other movement is the rage. So it's like contraction is the mom. And then there's a, an expansive, usually explosive part that can be different. But it, it's a specific, uh, when I go mom, that's very specific. It's, it, you can't even completely describe it, uh, which is why it's, it's beyond just taking general emotions as like anger and go beat on the bed with a racket and blow off steam. That doesn't work. It doesn't, it, it, you blow off steam and you sort of let it out and then it comes back. So this is, this can happen in five seconds. And I've had many people that were ready and it, it happened very quickly, although it can take some time to get them to that point. Yeah, you met with, I mean, you've been doing this stuff for 20 years or something, right? Yeah. yeah. And so you probably met with hundreds of people over that time. Um, and um, I think we'll we'll gain a clearer under clearer understanding of what exactly you do as we go along. But um, are you fi do you find that a fairly significant percentage of people um, undergo quite a radical transformation in a short amount of time? Let's say I don't know how long they spend with you, but and that it lasts. I mean, they really resolve something, and then five years later, it's still resolved. Yes. If they give up what they believe. That, that, that might <laughs> be easier said than done in many cases. Yeah. It is easier. It's, yeah, it's very difficult to give up being right. right. <laughs> yeah. But, but right invokes wrong. So if you're right, you're going to be wrong too. So that's the circle. It's like, okay, right and wrong are there. Or in my circle, I have one that feels they're right. And, I, and it says, it talks sometimes, and I think it, the thought's there. But I just don't accept it. I don't take it in and completely believe it. That's what I mean by give, giving up being right. It isn't that you won't have the thought or it won't make its appearance or you're in an argument and you can feel yourself doing it. But ultimately to just sort of practice realizing that, that if, if everybody's right, I mean, that can't be truth. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was uh, the Buffalo Springfield, remember, who sang, nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For what it's worth was the name of that song. Um, so this must, I mean, are you still doing this or has COVID kind of put the brakes on it? Uh, somewhat, but I've sort of, you know, uh, starting when I started writing my book in 2013, uh, I sort of let go of working the internet, the websites, it became a whole different ball game. 
you know, back in the beginning, you could manipulate the, the search engines to end up on a front that, page. I used to do that for a living for many years. <laughs> And uh, that no longer became possible in that way. You had to have a lot, you, you know, the social platforms, and I, it just isn't my thing. So I sort of just let that go and, and focused on my book, and then I started doing audiobooks. And so, yeah, I, I can go, you know, I can have a busy month or I can have a month free. Uh, it, uh, the nice thing is that's not how I make my living anymore. So uh, I, I have no attachment to it, uh, but I feel... I don't know. I feel I'm supposed to keep doing it. I feel that there's a service there that, that is important for me as a person, too, because in a way, it's my social life, yeah, too. Yeah. Are you able to do it online with people, or do they have to come to be with you physically? No, actually, the, the sort of primordial movement one, I often do online. Uh, and, uh, or sometimes it can be just kind of a counseling yeah. session. Yeah. Uh, but usually I can make an impact on somebody if I can get if I can get them to do something like mom, right, with me and do it. But it can be very difficult because I encounter the stubborn one. And they might go instead of mom, they'll go, Mom, <laughs> mom. <Yeah. laughs> so the mind's very clever. Also, when I use the body, when I say that, mom, it's like I'm reaching with my hands uh, facing toward the sky. It's, it's more of a helpless position. So one way they can change the vibration is they move the hands facing down or to the sides. Your hands are so important in bringing in emotion to your body. It's dance. And uh, even by a little, you know, this. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, you know about you know, mudras, right? And... That people yeah. would do yeah, an Indi exactly. Indian dance there. The hands are so expressive and they're doing all these yeah. things. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I'm just, you know, sort of uh, invoking that by using, you know, these different positions uh, in places of the body and the voice. So the voice is like music and you have to hit the right note. If you don't hit the right note, it won't move it won't energize it so to speak so we're trying to energize what people have basically tried not to energize so by doing that we are owning it rather than it owning us but we are owning it with love which is just space which is just the sky to the weather <laughs> um there was another part to mike's question let me ask that he said um with having He's talking about your YouTube channel. With having so many different teachers and traditions on your channel, from Advaita Vedanta, Buddhism, Kriya Yoga, etc., is there one specifically that you practiced? And do you ever get confused with such a variety of, of different spiritual things that you're putting your attention into? You know, with most religious or, or isms, uh, I always try to look for what they have in common rather than what they don't have in common or where they conflict. And I end up with my own. That's what medicine one is, basically. Um, I don't particularly consider myself a follower of any of them. Uh, it, it, I'm a follower of medicine one, which uses, you know, I, I, I feel... I'm just taking the knowledge that's been out there in many different forms, and I'm just allowing it to come through me in a circle in the desert the way that it wants to. Uh, and it comes through me through my interaction with people. Yeah, I, I could describe my own experience that way, and you know, in terms of not being an adherent of any particular religion, but it, kind of respecting them all by recognizing that they all have the same fundamental you know, source. And uh, and so many people, the, the deepest people in all the religions, I think, realize that, you know, and then other people yeah. don't, and they, they're out on one of the spokes, and they see all the other religions as being in conflict with theirs, and so on. But Yeah. 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 Um, somebody else sent in a question, I think actually it was Irene, um, <laughs> say, <laughs> saying, uh, Irene Archer from Fairfield, Iowa, wants to know, um, 
I want to hear all about your greatest teachers and helpers. Um, how how many are are you referring to as dogs? How many of are current? Oh, how many are currently in your in your pack? <laughs> she said. That's why I, I realized it was dogs. Yeah. You have some cool stories about your well, dogs in your book, by the way. Yeah, they're difficult stories. Yeah, yeah. They're my stories of loss mm -hmm. because one got bit by a rattlesnake yeah. and other things. Yeah. Um, the first, well, I had dogs when I was very young. And then when I moved and lived in Sedona and did uh, arc, uh, I forgot the word now, uh, archaeological tours and stuff, I got a wolf. I actually got an 80% wolf as a pup. And uh, so that was my, my, my way back into that. And that was also just about the time that I started doing what I do. And uh, he, he just, they, 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 they aren't at all. I mean, I can yell and scream like crazy when I'm doing a session. Uh, it, and somebody that went by the house would think some kind of form of domestic violence <laughs> is probably going on. <laughs> but my dogs, they just, some will just lay there. And, yeah. You know, they don't do a thing. I just think, oh, dad's uh, doing but, his thing again. <laughs> yeah, so that dog was Dakota. Uh -huh. And, uh, he uh, he was the thing is with these types of dogs, which I call wolf dogs because they're very close to that uh, breed uh, species. That they don't often get along with other dogs because they're so territorial or protective, and uh, so it always adds a, an extra component to taking care of them, and. Uh, so that was Dakota, and he died of cancer. And uh, I wrote a song for him. Uh, say something that what's the the chorus goes: "I am what I am, a wolf spirit again, and I'll be with you always, my friend. In our life, I was free. You just let me be wild, woolly, and free. Now it's all up to you to be wild and free, to be the soul that you are." So it goes something nice. like I that. Think in your book, you <laughs> actually sing some of these songs. It's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then there was. Uh, Wolf, a dog named Wolf, and uh, very similar type of dog, but uh, and would always he lays, you know, the dogs will lay next to people. Oftentimes, when I'm actually doing the session, I sometimes get dogs that uh, or people they're afraid of dogs, uh, and I just use that because fear, of course, is one of the main things to be the circle to uh, the vibration of it. And so it can be a way to sort of relax to that. So I always look at it as, well, there's a reason, you know. And sometimes the dogs are laying on either side of these people at the end, and it's been an important part of their experience. Or the dogs, somebody's afraid of a height, and they're walking along this cliff, and the dog is right there with them. And it feels like they, they feel that the dog, you know, was, was consciously helping them. Um, so, yeah, and... Yeah, there are many dogs, but I've had some some bad traumas too uh, with the dogs. I had you know, my face ripped open by one that when I broke up a fight, and uh, yeah, one was bit by a rattlesnake, mm -hmm. and you almost lost um, a couple of a couple of them in the desert, but they showed up again. That uh, oh yeah, that was... they, I've had yeah, they run away, <laughs> and uh, and you know I used to chase them, but. Uh, any more recent years when they run away, I just yeah, wait. You come back. We, we have a dog that's kind of psychic, actually. Um, you know, we can't say, geez, you know, the weather's kind of nice. Maybe we should take a walk because that would be too blatant. But so we resorted to language such as, well, it's pretty cool out and it looks like it's not going to rain. And the dog will actually come running in from the other room, ears perked up, tail wagging, like, okay, okay, let's do it. You know, she, she, he actually picks up on the thought, you know, wow. even if we use... Wow, so you don't actually say... No, we don't say any of those words. Like just that, to, just, if, you have, if we have practically even just have the thought that we might take a walk, yeah, he, he comes running in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a guy named Rupert yeah. Sheldrake who wrote a book that called Dogs... That, oh, yeah. yeah you know that book. dogs yeah, that know yeah. when their owners are coming home? No, no, but the one I know is the bio... Uh, the one about... Uh, the fields right, of uh, memory. Right, um, morphogenetic fields, yeah. Yeah, yeah, morphogenic yeah. fields, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're getting a little off, but actually it's nice, nice to talk <laughs> about dogs. Well, not actually. Morphogenic oh. fields uh, is in a way, in a sense, sort of related uh, to all this. A way you could look at what I'm tapping into when I dream yeah, for people. Yeah, But mm -hmm. it's, you know. 
Let's talk about um, your own life a little bit. Um, you've been through some stuff. Uh, I mean, you had this horrific car accident when you were 25 and various other things. But, you know, I, I got the impression in reading your book that you look on it all now as learning experiences, you know, and you wouldn't be who you were had you not gone through all those things as traumatic and as injurious as they may have been. Yeah, it's it's another way for me that without uh, my difficulties, medif medicine of one would no 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 more exist either because it's what's brought me through it because I still have a lot of difficulties from that accident and uh, on every level and I have to you know, every day uh, be, be that love to myself, to feelings of powerlessness and helplessness and frustration and all the things that, you know, most normal people have going on in our life. And uh, so it, it's, it's really through using it myself, even with all the stories with my dogs and how to move through the traumas quickly rather than have them own me so I can keep loving dogs. Uh, and yeah, and for me, there was a period uh, where it was my sort of journey in the underworld in San Francisco and somewhat in New York of, uh, you know, I was a bartender and uh, it was back in the early 70s. And, the, you know, it was North Beach and all the poets and musicians. I used to go to a place called the Coffee Gary and play my guitar and sing. Uh, Janis Joplin started, used to sing there. Uh, and, uh, but it was, you know, <laughs> drops of LSD in the eye. <laughs> I heard you mention that. So, People actually did it that way? I, I never heard of doing it that yeah. way. Why would you do that rather than up your nose or something? It's very... Well, Just it's, gets it into the bloodstream, I guess, huh? Yeah. It, wow. You know, um, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no. so, uh, so this car accident, you were 25, you got an, what was it, an Austin Martin? Austin, Austin Healy. Healy. Is that what James Bond drew, drew, drove, or was that an Austin Martin that he drove, I think? Probably an Austin yeah. Martin. Yeah, the Austin Healy was, had a huge six-cylinder engine. It, it could go back then in 19, what, 60, what was it, 65, I think. Uh, that was the year of the car, uh, 130. And uh, it had an overdrive. And uh, I had actually bought the car my father died, and I drove the car back to uh, Michigan to go to my father's funeral, and it broke down. So I had to leave it there. No, actually, the car broke down before that, and I left it there. And when my father died, I went back to Michigan, and my uncle helped me rebuild this whole car for six weeks from the bottom up. We actually filed down the cylinders to, to make it because we couldn't get new ones and things. And so, yeah, I was driving back with a friend from Michigan to California and, uh, <laughs> you know, still doing stupid yeah. things. Uh, and, and you, met, you mentioned so you I had a Quaalude it. and a beer about half yeah, an hour had, before yeah, that. A friend handed me a Quaalude. I didn't, you know, I said, oh, okay, you know, and, and then we drank a half a beer and, uh, and I got too relaxed and, you know, I, I, at the same time I had taken it up, the engine was broken. So I was, I took it up to 120. And uh, as I was coming down, I looked off the side of the road for a minute. And then all of a sudden I'm in one of these uh, sort of a, a marker post I hit head on. And I overreacted and uh, turned the wheel and apparently it flipped, but did not keep flipping. It flipped and landed on the top. And this was a rag top. They didn't, all they had was a piece of cloth on the top. Uh, so it actually shaved off part of the steering wheel. And these are teeny cars. There's no room in them when you're in them. There's no place to go. <laughs> the, 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 the seats are on the floor as it is. Your feet are straight out in front of you. But somehow I got away from the pavement uh, almost. It hit my head and my shoulder, slid for 330 feet underneath it, uh, was knocked out for 15 minutes. But the friend that came out with me, uh, he managed to stop a doctor and who they two, the two of them flipped the car and I walked out and I went to the justice of the peace the next day for reckless driving. And 
uh, and I left. I just left the car. I, it's, it's actually a perfect example of what you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> is, you know, something happens and you just walk away. So oh, you know, what else could you have done? I, I guess they gave you a fine for reckless driving. And I mean, the car was probably totaled. Uh, well, I guess what I mean, if, uh, I'm talking perhaps emotionally. And I'm also talking uh, these days, somebody might at least go to a chiropractor or something or get things checked. I didn't do anything. It's like a cowboy he falls off the horse and just, you know, I'm OK, you know. Uh, but, you know, and so on a physical level, these sort of things collect in us, too. Yeah, as, as traumas and as, as physical injuries. I mean, so you've had problems all your life because of that accident. Yeah, it, it actually, without my knowing it, I did not know exactly what happened. And to, to, in fact, I'm still learning, uh, but only probably within the last 15 years of how it basically drove my head down into my spine uh, kind of compressed your vertebrae or something yeah it, and it, it com but it, it so it caused all the soft tissues to it's like if i got stuck in the in the the reaction to curling up into a ball to get away from the pavement and stayed there so the first effects were pressure in the head on the sides of my head uh, about six months later but it started to affect the brain uh, because I, it, the blood flow, basically. So I went through all kinds of stuff for closed head injuries, uh, football players, you know, uh, biofeedback, looking at the brain, the brain waves. And so I went to many specialists and the, when they looked at my brain, it looked like I had closed head injuries, slow places in the brain, which some of this perhaps, I don't know, uh, could have resulted in allowing me to do some of what huh. I do. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, there are stories of people having brain injuries and then suddenly they become an expert pianist or something, having never played piano before. You know, some some kind of gift, some kind of ability. I forget what the name is, but it, I interviewed a lady who studies these people. and uh, But some kind of, you know, it's like Rain Man or something, some kind of ability will blossom all of a sudden after the brain is injured in some way and some scientists theorize that the brain is like a filter that actually shuts down a lot of the um input that we would otherwise get and in, in some cases some injury to the brain can diminish its filtering ability so we're suddenly flooded with information or abilities that we didn't have before right uh or maybe you're just there's a uh, some you know it's like with the morphic field thing you're now resonating with another field that you couldn't resonate with before and all that talent comes through yeah i mean there's this guy who actually is a he he, he performs concerts now and he, he does this amazing improvisational wow. piano stuff he just kind of makes it up on the spot and he just he wasn't a, really a piano player before that it's just kind of started happening after he had this i forget whether it was some kind of stroke or injury or something to his brain yeah <laughs> yeah wow. i mean it's not something you'd want to have happen necessarily but sometimes these things happen it, it, it raises intriguing questions yeah 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 so uh so then you know obviously you've, you did all kinds of other things various educational experiences traveling all over the world and all over the country and everything else at, at what point do you feel like um spirituality became sort of an explicit motivation like in your mind you began to really question in a spiritual sense uh, or maybe you'd always been doing that or, but, or or maybe you had and didn't know it in a certain point you knew it well i guess the the line I would draw would be between it became part of my work in the world. And before that, it was just when I was really young, I just had this sense of, uh, of wanting to live an aware life. And, uh, you know, I studied uh, acting, but when I studied acting, it was a spiritual discipline for me. Because to me, this it's the study of the human heart. And you know, why do we do things? And uh, and I early on uh, learned 
that the best acting, of course, is those who are able. To, it's I remember this phrase. It was your your point of power is in the present. So it is really an actor's ability to be present that allows the best actors to do what they do. Uh, the only difference is they're creating an imaginary present to react to and, and believing it. But they have to be very present because of the way the mind gets in there. You know, the stakes are very high when you're uh, being filmed or performing that to be good. <laughs> uh, so the mind wants to get in there and make sure that you are and make sure that you say things right and all that. It's the same thing with the audio books. A lot of people read the book and try to do it without making any mistakes. So that becomes what it sounds like. Mm. Uh, too tentative? Whereas for me... They're huh? too tentative or something while they're doing it because they're trying to be too yeah, careful. They're, there's too much, yeah. There's too much attention placed on being perfect, so to speak, not making any mistakes, as opposed to having fun and uh, just being kind of a channel. And I like to sort of take on the persona of whoever wrote the book. Yeah, you kind of mind meld with them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which is for me interesting because with Nizar Gadatta, he's very unique. He's got a real edge. He was, he was a character. He, he was, he, he's like a, a sharp knife. Raman is like a butter knife. And he, he's, he's got a choppiness, a staccato yeah. to him. And that's why in a lot of some of his books, especially I Am That and his earlier books, that's the way I read it. Because uh, I'm trying to, I'm taking him in. You know, it's like this sharpness. Um, and it's by my taking him in that I take in those learnings on a certain unconscious level. But later on, newer translations put his words together in a different way that didn't have that. So I didn't read them that way. I read them slower and more, uh, yeah. So I sometimes, I actually have a lot of wonderful people that give me a lot of compliments. But I also have some people that almost hate me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's like, I hate that voice. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I guess if, if you try, if, if obviously, if you get if if you work to have everybody like you, you're not going to be very good. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's possible. Um, it's funny. I mean, even you watch any, look at any YouTube video, uh, and there's always some thumbs down, you know. There's, yeah. I've never seen a YouTube yeah. video that has only thumbs up. <laughs> Actually, I could put you in touch with a guy, if you're interested, who spent time with Nisargadatta, and he, he's been on Bat Gap a couple of times. He's, he's a friend of mine. Timothy oh. Conway is his name. and He lives in Phoenix, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah, okay. he'd be happy to tell you some anecdotes or something about what it was like being with Nisargadatta. Yeah. yeah. He's a great okay. guy. In fact, I think he might, he's talking about moving to Sedona, so that would be interesting. Um, okay, so have you... Um, have you done? Have you, you don't seem like the kind of guy who would have sort of done a regimented daily spiritual practice. It seems like your whole orientation is more fluid than that, and kind of more more earth oriented or something or other. Am I right? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I do. I, I've done a, a very easy, uh, not stringent, but every morning yoga practice. Uh, Every morning for thirty-five years. Nice. Must be must help with um, your body too. Yeah, it just sort of gets me. It gets me so I can think a little bit <laughs> and stuff, and uh, and I know my body needs that, uh, especially as we get older. Um, and so, and when I was, you know, my other way would be, yeah, it's not like I go and sit for two hours starting at four a.m. in the morning. Uh, my thing would be just to go out in the circle where it's beautiful and I'm in a powerful place and just be the, sit there at the center and, and just keep bringing myself back to that. And at the same time, my body, mind self gets to enjoy the elements, but I know, you know, I, I just use that as, uh, to bring myself back and it's, 
Yeah. When you say you go out and sit in a circle, do you mean like you've created a circle of rocks or something out in your yard and it's just a kind of like a power spot that you've created for yourself where you go and sit? Uh, well, most of these are actually circles out in the National Forest. Oh, okay. That you've created or that are just out there? Yeah, oh, that I've okay, created. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a whole webpage that's on medicine circles and medicine wheels. Um, my first one was up on this mountain where Jerome is uh, in a rock called Rhyolite. So it for me, it is a place I don't really, I don't know what the word is, uh, promote them as they are sacred power spots for me and most people feel that they are too but i don't i, I don't say much more about it than that uh people that do my form of vision quest that's where they sleep they sleep in the circle and part of their reason to be out there is to gather what's out there that they've tried to throw out so we use objects like uh Maybe their anger could be a, a, a cactus that's been broken off somewhere, or uh, maybe their innocence as a child is a little white flower, or maybe they're rocks. Uh, and their the whole thing is to work with themselves and bring them into the circle, and then I, I help them and help them work through that. So, but the circles, they are, so that circle I use as a way to talk about your I am, physical, true presence, and as it's also a place on the land that when you stand out there, you, the circle uh, makes the feeling of the, the spaciousness of the sky, it takes you into it. So it is circles within circles onto infinity. So the circle is both a physical place that has an energy, but it's, 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 it, it helps take you into the circle of self. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you get to enjoy it too. I'll tell you a funny story about about 30 years ago, um, Irene and I were on our way out to um, Parker, Arizona, to visit her mother, and we we it was our first camping trip. Then we we spent the night in Sedona, in uh, I guess it's north of the town. There's a stream that comes down, and we camped there. But then we went in the next day, and we we actually went to the Chamber of Commerce, and we said we hear about all these power spots in Sedona. How do you find the power spots? And they actually gave us a map. <laughs> Here's the power spots. And so we st we went to some trailhead and we were hiking along looking for the power spot and we kept running into all these other people and we sort of would sheepishly ask each other, have you found yeah. the power spot? And it's like, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I did have a really profound experience in Sedona one time. I was with some friends and I went to that um, that slide rock state park and yeah. we were swimming and sliding down and through the water and as it began to get dark we just kind of sat in a circle actually and i i was drawn inwardly so deeply that i couldn't talk or anything else i, I was just gone for a while and i could hear them talking but i, I really couldn't interact it so maybe that was the influence of sedona i don't know well i think that's that it's i mean it's the fact that the earth is has places that have particular energies, you know, just on a very almost superficial level, magnetic and electrical and, you know, fault lines and water under the earth creates as it flows. And uh, and so I do think that's the, that these places help us. Uh, they help us go to what's already within us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I guess some people get too attached to the outside of it to think that they need that then. So I have places that are this bone rock. Um, it's a bone white rock. It creates these smooth washes. And it, it to me, it's got the highest resonance. So it's m much more high for me than uh, the red rock. Uh, and so different colors, you know. That's one of the things. Sedona is a place of color. It's color. The green, you know, uh, junipers and cypress and the red rocks and I live on the other side. Sedona for me is the masculine, the red fiery rock. I live on the feminine side, which is more rolling. And then Mingus Mountain is a kind of feminine mountain because it's very soft and flowing. So uh, I actually, some circles I have that are right in the middle and they sort of are the connection between the two f forces or sides. And uh, 
this thing about picking up objects, I, 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 there was an interesting story in your book, uh, Medicine of One, where you were with this guy and uh, you were down by some stream and you asked him to just sort of go along the stream and pick up anything that might be meaningful to him. And one of the things he picked up was a dirty sock, something that most of us wouldn't you know, really want to pick up. But it turned out that it had significance to him because um, when he was little, his mother had made him wear socks on his hands uh, instead of gloves when he went to school, and the kids ridiculed him for it. And it turned out this this ended up being a very cathartic experience for him with, with your help and in interaction. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about either that specifically or about that whole thing you do where people find particular little objects and then somehow it helps to bring about a healing for them with your assistance. Yeah, I've had times where actually there's a place, you know, people, uh, sometimes there's places out in the middle of nowhere where people like to dump their trash. Yeah. Uh, uh, all forms, not not just garbage from food, but mattresses, electronic devices, cans, flat tires. But I found it an interesting place to take people because to for them to gather what they've thrown out of the circle of themselves in order to have peace. So, you know, one way to look at that is you could pick a theme. You could pick a, a theme of to gather all the people who've hurt you. Now, you're not really, what you're doing is perhaps you're picking something that reminds you of that person, but what you're really picking up is everything you feel in relationship to that person. That's what you bring into the circle, all your feelings. So that sock, so yeah, and it, so it's clearly not something you pick up that you like. In fact, the more, uh, it, it would be better to say that you probably don't like them because that's what you're pushing away. So the sock, um, yeah, it was about this story and, and his mother shaming him, making him feel this shame. And the, so there's, there's the vibration of shame for one. And then there's the rage with his mother, which is really the one that needs to move to just sort of energize it all. So that's what I'm trying to get him to, rather than to tense around it, get away from it, think about it. I'm actually bringing in all the vibrations and relation that that sock could have anything to do with. And if he can, and he's doing it in the circle. So the circle helps him be the circle to that vibration. And then it can move that story out of him in a sense. So he's no longer carrying that with him. And it happens really ultimately in a few seconds. Um, but there's sometimes people who have, they've been to therapy their whole life. And, but much, a lot of therapy is just talk. And, uh, or it's, if they do take people into their feelings, oftentimes the therapist, there's regions that they aren't comfortable going. So they stay away from them. And rage is probably one of them. Uh, I mean, how do you, how do you love rage? <laughs> how do you honor that? It, it's, you know. But it's, it can actually be quite simple. Um, but one thing about when you bring in a violent feeling is when you bring it in and you take a breath and you let it move, what comes in is its opposite. The tears, the sobbing, the weeping. Because uh, that's what's energizing that rage is the hurt. Have you found that there are people who have come to you who had done a lot of therapy and hadn't made much progress, but then when they work with you, they, they have breakthroughs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I actually get psychologists and psychiatrists that come. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the only problem with that type is because they can be so analytically minded uh, it can get in the way. They know too much already, so to speak. Yeah, I was going to say, are there other people who just come and work with you and they think, eh, it's not working for me, nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, of course. I get fewer of those people because my website's pretty straight on. Mm -hmm. I don't. I try not to attract anybody that's not right for me, so I probably scare away a lot yeah. of people. 
<laughs> but but that's my intention in yeah, a way. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, but most of the people I get these days, they're ready. But I still get some people that, no, I can't do that. It's like they can't do it. It's like I can't do that. You mean they don't want to do what you would recommend that they do? Is that what you're saying? They don't want to. They don't want to engage the feeling. Uh -huh. But you've kind of warned them ahead of time uh, that that's what that's what oh, you yeah, want them absolutely. to do. Absolutely, yeah. I actually had a couple of women uh, towards the beginning of the year. Two doctors, two women doctors, and one was completely on board. But the other one, actually, when I did a session, part of her session was this was the wall. She had a it was the dominance of this wall. It, and it was a wall to me as well. And that actually comes into the session. So then when we were out in the circle working, I worked with her friend who participated fully. And then after her, this other woman watching that, it was like, uh, uh, I don't think I can yeah. do that. And I said, oh, and what I say is that's fine. You don't have to do anything. I don't have an agenda, you know, uh, so that's that's really my point of with everybody. It's like, you know, the, the, there's no, uh, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, no, I picked that up in listening about the way you work. It's like you're not forcing anybody. You know, there was that guy who was in the secret who ended up going to jail because he kind of for, forced yeah. these people to be in a sweat lodge much hotter and longer than they should have been and some people died and everything so i mean and there's there's other people who are getting people to do stuff that's potentially dangerous like walking on hot coals or you know doing really scary things i i, I didn't get the sense that you try to put people through anything like that well i think that most people are hard on themselves uh, they have a pusher and um that's part of the problem so even when somebody does what my form of a vision quest, it's not about suffering. It's not about severity. Sometimes somebody could be out there one night and that's all they need is one night. You guys and then spend, they sleep you, in town. Oh, the next I see. Day. So you like set up tents and spend the night? N no right. tent. Just sleeping usually. on the ground? It's just sleep in the oh. circle on a, you know, sleeping uh -huh. bag, uh, a pad. Yeah. Um, if it's raining, yeah, there might be a tent, but no camping gear, you know, it's very minimal. Um, but, and, you know, sometimes people are unsure of if they want to do that. And I said, well, we'll just figure it out. We'll let it see if that's the right thing to do once you're here. Uh, and I always tell them, you know, there's no right way or wrong way. It, it's, you know, um, sometimes uh, it's a, a person who generally pushes themselves to do things like that. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a positive thing for them to decide to be soft to themselves and loving that, okay, I, I don't need to do it another night. Yeah. So, cause that's really the essence to me of that's what I'm trying to, to get, have people have is a different relationship with their emotional being, uh, where they are this softness to themselves. Nice. Yeah. And that note actually segues us back to a thought that I had in, <clears throat> towards the beginning of our conversation where you were talking about, um, we were talking about the beach ball analogy of people trying to push beach balls under the water. In other words, trying to stuff and stifle, um, one's emotions or, you know, painful inner things. And, uh, I'm always reminded of the opioid epidemic, which is so, terrible in the United States. And uh, that's an extreme example of, of a, a principle which I think is similar in terms of people's addiction to their cell phones or other things that they just use to kind of like numb themselves out, you know. Uh, but of course, with opioids, it kills them. And I don't know, maybe you can just comment on that phenomenon in kind of on a societal level, what, what we're doing to ourselves. And what it might take to, um, again, on a societal level, uh, open up to the kind of sensitivity and honesty that you're trying to uh, inculcate in people. You mean how to... Well, it's like you're working one-on-one -on -one and you help people kind of unnumb yeah. themselves, you know? And it seems like the whole society needs to get unnumbed uh, 
and, and a lot of, a lot well, of stuff yeah. needs to be processed so that people aren't so uh, in these addictive behaviors. Well, here's the way I look at it, that I always tell people, you know, let's say that that is a person's mission, uh, just what you described, to, ha to help have a positive effect on that societal addiction to things like that, to run away from their pain. That's where, for me, the one noble truth of to live at the center. So to live at the center means first you you have gone and, and been this true action of self-love to what moves inside of you. Your gift is coming into the world and you treat, it's the golden rule. You treat everybody the way you want to be treated. And so you become, it's that old thing. You are the demonstration of what you want other people to be. Um, it, it sounds like yours is what you're, talking about is perhaps more of an activist type role for to you know to affect people on that level well, not that not that know. you would necessarily be the activist to transform society but it seems to me that society needs transformation and um and one of its one of the symptoms of its sickness is you know this attempt by millions and millions of people to numb out you know to, to stifle and suppress and, and not feel what the things that are uncomfortable to feel. And it's never, it's not working. <laughs> no, but the thing is that the, the way I look at it is they've just found, I mean, the, these people have always found ways to avoid. And now they just have a lot more toys in a lot which more to means, do that. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, to me, the part of the worst thing of this is that we don't we don't go to stores anymore and and have connections with people and you know the local grocery store or the little hardware shop or uh, and it's it, it that you know and that's why in the whole uh, addiction to the social platforms and that's and the illusion of it and. I guess to me, I guess that has to start when people are children. They have to be sort of educated. Uh, but to me, it's I, I guess I'm more of a individual, as you said, deal with one on one. Um, you know, affecting it on that level beyond its effect of each individual's vibration changing the whole. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. No, that's that, but that's the way it is, actually. I mean. Um, I remember some hearing some parable about some father or something showing, you know, giving his son a whole bundle of sticks that was all bound together and saying, break it in half, you know, and, and the son couldn't do it. And then the, the, as it worked out, they had to untie the bundle and he could break each stick individually and get the whole thing broken. But I mean, the point of the analogy is that, um, if the if society is going to change, then every individual has to change in some fundamental way. Uh, another a good example would be a, a tree, a forest of trees, and if they're all kind of gray and withered, then you can't just spray paint the forest. You have to water the roots of each tree, and then you'll have a, eventually a green forest. So, like you said a minute ago, that well, it has to start when you're young. But most of the people listening to this obviously are not young, um, and right. they. So there must be a means, and you actually help to provide a means, and there are there are many means whereby we can kind of do some remedial work and and uh, heal stuff that would it would be nice if it hadn't happened in the first place, but it has. So we we need to have as many efficient means as possible for people to purge themselves of of these of these things and live the happiness that is really ultimately their birthright, I would say. Well, as you were talking, one of the, the things that seems to be at the core um, is that, you know, in the sense of living at the center, m many of those types of people, whatever their gift is to the world, it's not, it's not happening. It's not able to come right, through they're them. Stuck. So they don't, and they don't have a sense of worth, uh -huh. and that's part of the pain they're coming up is is this lack of, you know, a, a worth, a value. Uh, to me, it's one of the principal pains that I have with uh, people, um, and to me, freeing up 
so when I when I say when I re- move the emotional energies, I always look at it as uh, liberation. I never use words like even let go, um, because when you liberate those energies, you are liberating. It's like I brought my flute here. So this flute, it's like we're all born like a flute, and we have this these holes, the, which some people you could. Uh, uh, tie up with all the chakras and we all come with a uh, see if I, I don't play this much anymore but so we come with a song it's in harmony things happen to us the holes get gummed up and then it's out of harmony we don't feel worth our value our song doesn't get to come through and we find ways to medicate that that core feeling of uh, you know, and, and it, it, of course it goes down to that question too of who am I? Because ultimately you have to pass through, I'm really not what I do. Yeah, <laughs> as, as I think Deepak Chopra or somebody always says, you know, we're not human doings, we're human beings. And so we have to get, get in touch yeah. with our innermost being. Um, that's nice. Well, you, a phrase you said a few minutes ago, you know, that, we all have some kind of gift to give to the world. And a few months ago, I interviewed a guy named Stephen Cope, who wrote a book about Dharma. And his his point was that, you know, everybody does have some gift to give to the world, which is not to say we're all going to be Einsteins or Mozarts or anything like that. But in our own sphere of influence, there's something precious that we alone can contribute. And um, most people don't really find that groove you know in life or many people don't i don't know the percentage but his effort in writing that book and i think your effort in saying a lot of things you're saying here is to help more people find it um and and there would be a a kind of a frustration obviously if we don't find it or can't find it because whether we're conscious of it or not there's an urge to express it and we're if it's not being expressed we're going to feel that as some kind of a bottled upness, you know? Yeah, and a classic kind of situation is uh, a woman who married young and had children and is the type that does everything for everybody. So she loses herself and she's 50 and now she doesn't know who she is. Uh, and she's tired of thinking about everybody else and nobody thinking about her. And But she, she was... In a way, unfortunately, there's a payoff for what I giving too much. And the payoff is that, first of all, you're in control when you're the giver. And second of all, you're, you want something. You want that sort of positive feedback when you're doing these things for other people. So on an unconscious level, it's sort of like you're constantly earning your worth and value in that way. Uh, and But you realize that people take it for granted eventually so it it becomes yeah they just take it for granted they expect that you to do that and so anger builds up in that person and all these other feelings and uh, and yeah and they don't know well, who am i what am i here to do uh are you describing so, a woman that you actually worked with or is this just a hypothetical oh yeah i've, I've had many women like yeah. this yeah and so what would you do to help uh, such a person first of all i'd say what do you want how do you want to feel? Um, well, probably, and, and so the, when I say that, these are big feelings, so to speak, like freedom. Um, maybe they don't trust themselves. Maybe they don't trust other people. So you can't do much if you don't trust, if you don't, because y- you get in the way. Uh, and so there might be four of these things like trust, freedom, Maybe they need one of the things is love, but more more in the form of self love. They don't know what it is to love themselves. And to me, part of that is it's such a cliche. What does that really mean? And to me, it really means being this loving presence to everything that moves in you. That's where it begins. Um, and there might be uh, another word like um, what's a word that people um, worth. Just worth um, from within you, not coming to you from the outside. So once we lay that out, like in this circle with the four directions and they work with each other, 
okay, so it's like we want to then find out, okay, in your journey through life, probably when you were already a child, and I don't really necessarily go through them telling me their story. Uh, it comes in in the dreaming aspect frequently. That's how I start to bring things into the circle. I'm helping them do that. Um, to me, they're stuck in that story uh, that they lived for 20 or 30 years because of an older story probably that they're stuck in. And what's stuck is the emotional energies that energize this, you know, their need to do this in order to have value, but it really doesn't have value. So you could get caught up in the psychology, but if you can just get them to keep identifying themselves as this presence to their emotional being and let them move, things just change, they loosen up. So that their gift is freed. And let's say clarity was one of the things that they wanted. Then maybe they didn't know what they wanted. Maybe they didn't know what they were supposed to do. So that, that something loosens up and now they know because maybe an inclination that they had, they trust it now. Oh, I can do this. Um, so this is all that, that gift I call the spine of your oh, life. Oh, yeah, that phrase. I wanted to ask you about that. Go ahead and say more about yeah. that too. And, and to me, that's, that's sort of the last place I end up with people. When I'm in the circle, we've we sort of brought things into the circle. We've moved them uh, with the idea of them being at the center. And so I have people find usually a stick. It could be a flute. It could be a walking stick. Anything to sort of embody what I call the spine of your life, which is this thrust. It's like in, uh, I use the example of a, a theater, a, a drama, a play they have what they call a spine in them that everything ties into. Uh, people's lives in, and characters also have their spines that everything comes out of. So it's this thrust in their life that it is, most people usually have always been doing it in a way. It just hasn't allowed to express itself. So somebody could work, be in a, a tech company and really not want to be there and like it. Maybe they want to be, uh, uh, they've been doing Reiki and they want to work on people and help people instead of work for this tech company. So, but I ask them, well, what do you do? What do you like the most about the tech company? And what you find out is what they like most is maybe they're actually the tech person in the tech company that helps people with problems. So what they really like the most about it is helping people and they're helping people People come with a problem, they're distressed, they're helping them have peace. So the spine is a phrase. Um, so I had a musician once and they talked about being in this church and playing music and everybody just kind of calmed down and felt real peaceful. So their, their spine was to be the harmony that brings peace. So yes, they used a musical instrument, but it's also you as a person. You have to be it. That's why it's always to be to be the harmony that brings peace. Or it, it, it starts with being, and then from your being, it comes into the world. So it's it comes to you and through you first. It's not something you manufacture or do. Uh, some people is, is, to, is some form of just love, to be a love that creates freedom <laughs> uh, and, and empowers people. Um, but that love, you're, you're resonant with it like that musical instrument. You resonate with it, and that's really how you affect the whole world because you're that resonance, not constantly by doing. You let it be done through you. So. Yeah, well, that's good. There's a lot, of, a lot in what you just said. So just to put it in my own words to make sure I understood, um, so spine of your life would be like your sort of your core purpose or your, you, you know, that for which you are most that that course of action through which you can best contribute to the to the world um am i right so far yeah and it's it's it, it could be it could find its form through many types of work or even just being a mother yeah sure it doesn't have to be some glorious yeah. thing yeah uh, although being a mother can be glorious but it's it's you know and it's the word <laughs> dharma also that's the that's the word that the vedic okay. tradition has used for it and uh and one thing about dharma as i understand it is that not only is it the thing that you're 
you know, that really kind of lights your fire, but that, um, it's the thing that you're best suited to perform, that you, you can perform it most e easily. Like you said, you, you, it doesn't, you don't do it, it does you. And so if you find that, channel that groove then you kind of don't feel like you are doing a heck of a lot you just but you might be dynamically active and yet you feel like it's just flowing without resistance yeah and it's like with what i do to me what i consider the main thing that i do is get out yeah, of the way good. yeah <laughs> perfect, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> and then what is that bumper sticker you know let go and let god but that's that's a that's a talent that takes practice to get out of the yeah. way, because we're wired from the time we're kids to get in the way. It's true. The more the ego kind of congeals as, we, and it has to at a certain stage of our life. But the more you know, we kind of try to take over and run the show. Um, there's a there's a Vedic saying which is Brahman is the charioteer. In other words, Brahman meaning the the totality, the wholeness, the the oneness and uh it is but if you think you are then you really don't have the the same vision as as the, as the wholeness and you know things would go more smoothly if if you let the wholeness take the reins yeah yeah i had an interesting conversation email exchange with somebody last night where it was around the world the word control and um to me, in control invokes exactly what it is. There's tension usually in control, and um, and it's most all of us want to be in control. But we don't like feeling out of control. Uh, that's where the whole core feeling of softening. But there, you know, let's face it, we're not. Uh, we're going to die. Uh, things happen. Look at all the flooding and all the things that happen in the world that we can't control. Um, so that's, so th to me, it's a difference between that whole thing of go with the flow. So the flow, it isn't as if you're just jumping in the river and floating down wherever it takes you. Uh, I use an example of a raven flying in the air and the raven, uh, is, uh, has a lot of awareness with the air currents and everything and is making constant adjustments with its wings and stuff. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's just riding the wind. So it's trusting. So it's this, it's these three things of, uh, but it requires will. So there is will, but it doesn't have to have to me, the energy of control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's this th th threesome of, uh, will awareness, and trust. I like that the nursery rhyme on this point, no, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. You know, the stream is doing most of the work carrying the boat, but you are just sort of gently, you know, making adjustments like the raven so that you don't end up in the brambles or something or hitting the rocks. But so you are doing something, but the, the yeah. stream is really doing most of it. Yeah, and you've you've over experienced learn how to read the stream. Yeah, good point. Learn how where there's oh, that's probably a rock. Or you yeah, know some ripple you see and yeah. yeah Mark Twain talked about how riverboat captains could read little eddies and things in the river that would indicate some snag that might damage the boat they they just learned to to read it but there too the the Mississippi was doing most of the work <laughs> yeah yeah good um, so what haven't we covered is there anything that you know um, we're going to hang up and you're going to think, golly, I wish I'd talked about that. Well, probably not. Um, I mean, I think I've pretty much touched on most the aspect. The only aspect I would uh, share, perhaps, is kind of probably where this sense of to live at the center uh, and the circle uh, that I begin one of my books with, uh, the story about the Hopi. And like other, some natives in uh, South America, not sure what group it is, but they believe by their activity in a certain location, they keep the world in balance. So the Hopi story is that they believe this is the, well, we're moving into the fifth world. So each world was destroyed by man's greed, essentially. If you look at most things, it's greed for love, land, power, 
uh, which is driven by fear. So, so we're talking chronologically, or you know, there might have been five other civil, four other yeah, civilizations was, that died out, and yeah, yeah, and it's almost biblical. It's like destroyed by fire, ice, and a right, flood. Right. Uh, and the last time they came across the Pacific Ocean and read boats on these seven stepping stones, probably Hawaii was one, landed in Central America, and they were given instructions by their earth god, Maasau, to to migrate, to journey on the land in all the four directions where the land meets the sea, turn around and come back. And it actually creates kind of a swastika, the way it swirls. But they were ultimately to arrive at the center. So they look at all these abandoned settlements throughout the Southwest as the migrations, the footprints of the migration. Like the Anasazi and people like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so the settlement at the center will, by their spiritual practices, which are forms of vibration, dance, thought, the behavior, they keep the world in balance. That's the, and they live on the top of the Colorado Plateau, which is one of the most stable land masses on the earth. Uh, it, it's like plywood as opposed to normal wood. It's got these layers and stuff. And so it's very stable. It's got magnetic properties that are different Apparently, when all the cataclysms happen, it's a safe spot, and that's where they ended up. So, so that whole sense of, to, to you know, when I first got here, and I, so my influence of the Southwest and the land and the peoples, that also has come into medicine of one. So I just thought I'd share well, that's that. That's interesting. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any opinion about, you know, you mentioned cataclysms. Do you have any opinion about, you know, what might come in the, in the, the coming decades for humanity um i mean i can i don't expect you to speak yeah i i don't have my own prophecy but uh it's coming yeah a lot of people feel something's <laughs> coming uh you know whenever but it, i mean it, nothing can last forever anyway yeah. huh. uh but the whole climate change thing and just yeah it's it's accelerating it, you know it's i don't i, I don't want to be negative but it, it's it's yeah I, I think those things are almost past the point of no return uh and it, it's just something that the world's going to have to adapt to yeah um, another thing I, I mean look at what just happened in new york oh City. yeah i know it's outrageous there's nothing had ever happened like that was the, the previous record of rainfall in central park was like one inch and this time it was over three inches <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can only speculate, but I, in in addition, I mean, I have an optimistic streak in me because despite a good many solid reasons why we might all be going to hell in a handbasket, I I feel like there's this spiritual thing going on at the same time and uh, which is not maybe so obvious as as hurricanes, but that it's providing this kind of counterbalancing influence which hopefully will grow and grow and grow and eventually get the upper hand and, and that will really undergo some very beautiful transformation and, and not just end up in some kind of dystopia. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. I don't know if it'll happen on this planet. Yeah, it may not happen in our lifetimes, but... <laughs> well, it's... It, it, well, I, I, I don't know. You know, some people believe that you know, the earth experience almost is what it is. This is exactly uh -huh. what it is, all this experience uh -huh. that we have. And then once you move beyond the need to have these, perhaps there's another yep. level. There are a lot of uh, interesting teachings about that. I would like to think, yeah, it could happen on this earth and maybe it will. Uh, or maybe it will have to be just communities or, you know, but yeah, I, 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 I have that too. It's sort of like a balance between not pessimism, but you know, it's sort of like keep your, you know, it's like it's staring you in the face, uh, and man just doesn't. Uh, the whole greed thing is just that. It, it's what drives man for the on, on the, you know, it, money. Yeah. <laughs> well, thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, let's hope that comes true. Yeah. Um, one final point is. And this thought has occurred to me a number of times while I was listening to your book and also talking to you today, 
is, you know, I'm, I picture my, I put myself in the shoes of people who are listening. And, you know, you say certain things that sound great, like live in the center and, you know, find that quiet place within or however we would phrase it. And I, I kind of hear people saying, yeah, I want to, but how? I, I haven't quite figured out how. Um, you know, so what, what kind of advice do you have that people can kind of take with them, so to speak, uh, to make progress to, you know, achieving what you're advocating? Yeah, it's interesting because it's that's all I've been talking about. I know, about. I know. <laughs> so I want to make sure people sort of... But no, no, but yo, you're abs- I, I've sat in front of many people who, who do exactly what, who, but how do yeah, I do exactly. that? And I go, that's what I've been telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, you know, typical person working eight yeah, hours no, or raising yeah, kids no. or whatever, busy life. How do they incorporate something into their life so this act becomes an actuality? They, well, that's it. They've got to, you know, that's, I think a person has to find a space for some, for a space for themselves to have some form of practice when they practice being what I call their big eye, even if it's when they're driving in the car or, or so that it becomes part of everyday life. But the, the shift, the key is this shift between that most people have with this relationship with their emotional being. It's, it's one of disconnect rather than one of, uh, well, actually, let me say that. So one of the things I do at the end, once I get the spine of a person, is I have this ribbon of cloth that we write on it, some way to help them to move to the center. And it usually begins, it's got to begin with your breath. You, you, if, because everything that is the opposite of what people are stuck in is this upward controlling movement where too much thinking, holding the breath and tension in the body. So the first thing you've got to do is be able to come down, feel the space and take a breath. It sounds pretty it's ridiculously simple, but that to invoke that in that moment when you have a, a, a feeling that you don't like, as opposed to letting it sweep over you with tension, that's the key switch. If you can learn that, then you can undo the web but most people try to undo the web with their mind. And this is without the mind. You don't, you know, but it's the, the key, the trick is gonna be, okay, how, how do I bring in that vibration? Well, you know, my one of the ways is using the body and voice and whatnot, but when a person might just sit there in front of me and start telling a story and the feeling comes in when, you know, uh, it's it, and it's a hurt feeling, and you can literally see their body starting to contract, and they 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 sort of want to cry, but they're trying to stop it. You got to do the exact opposite. You let the story bring in the feeling, and take a big breath, and step into the space around you, and just be loved to that vibration, whatever it is, and that's what moves you to the center. Good. Very nice. Um, so let's say people want to work with you in some way. Um, what, what are the options? And let me show your website here on the screen. Um, showing it now. You won't be able to see it, but I'll link to your website from your page on batgap.com. So, um, you know, what, can, what can they expect? I mean, what are some things that you might do with people? And I guess they can get in touch with you through the website and so on, right? Yeah, the best way to get me is email. Um, and if they need to talk on the phone, that's fine, too. Do you want me to put um, your email address on your BatGap page so people can sure, just click yeah. on it? Yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll do that. I do Skype sessions, but just read that page and see if it's right for you. Uh, and, you know, it's the, the main things I do aren't that many, although it can look like it. It's this soul journey. That's called the soul journey session, this sort of dreaming uh, some people come to me just for that. Uh, if you have a deep core problem you've been working on, then I, I usually suggest uh, what I call my bare bones retreat that's spread over three days. Um, and what I do works quick. I don't spend a bunch of, uh, it's not activity oriented retreats. It's 
very focused and I fill each, the person's cup each day, so to speak. Um, and But I try not to overfill it. And then they have space to go out and go on a hike or whatever else they want to do. Uh, and then I have a different version of that retreat where they actually stay in the circle. That's the Vision Quest version. Um, but I'm I'm basically, the soul journey is usually where I start the Vision Quest or the retreat because it gives me things that I can't, we'll never figure out with their minds. Sometimes I don't need that person to tell me anything about themselves. I All I do is I take that session and then the, before I see them the next day, I choreograph it. And so I look at the different movements in it and I try to see how, okay, how can I bring this into their body more strongly? So there's usually a vocal element to it, like mom, okay, so that's got a body movement. Uh, and so I try to, the next day I may take them through those without ever talking, and then their story comes out as we do that in a way. Um, and so it's as if to get them to a place where they feel complete for now. Obviously, you're not going to achieve everything. And sometimes sometimes it's just giving people a sense of what they need to do. And they have to be patient with themselves. When you're dealing with people that have been severely traumatized, uh, it, has, it, it, it has its, it's own take time. A while. You can't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... But the key thing I always say, say to people is what I want them to go away with is, is that experience of be, of true action of self-love, that moment of, of some, like the feeling of terror, how to be this circle to the feeling of terror. And a person that has that terror in them is a person that's usually driven by a lot of anxiety. They worry a lot. They're, in, they're trying to constantly think about what's going to happen at the next stoplight. What's this person thinking? Because they were probably terrorized when they were a kid. Good. And then I, I do just, just straight sort of counseling and see what's going to happen. Some people just make an appointment. They don't know what they want to do. So <laughs> I just, okay, just well. Figure it out. Okay, great. Well, um, I will put your website and your email address on your page on BatGap. And if people... Oh, oh, you know what? If you if you might uh, put a link, if you feel like it, uh, to my uh, YouTube channel. Oh, yes. Is that possible? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. I'll link to whatever I you have, want. I have a lot of resources. Of my, it's me in front of the camera, sitting in front of a cir in the circle, talking about medicine one. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then it's it's a ton of uh, audio. I was so busy too. listening so, to your book that I didn't look much at your YouTube channel. So that's that sounds good. I gave you one link, so I didn't I didn't feel like overwhelming <laughs> you with a bunch of stuff. Uh, so. I, I like to take in as much as I can during preparing for these things, but um, I, I wanted to get through your book. All right, so good. So th thanks, Clay. I really appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to talk to me like this. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Beneath this video, if you're watching it on YouTube, there will be a link to the page on BatGap for Clay is, you know, for this interview. And then there, there will be links to all the things we've discussed, YouTube channel, books, website, email address, and so on. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, next week, I will be interviewing a fellow named Jeff Vanderklute, who lives in, yeah, in Col Crestone, Colorado, and seems like a very interesting guy. Um, so, and then it, we have an upcoming interviews page on BatGap if you want to check out who we've got scheduled for the next few months. So thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you next week. And thank you again, Clay. Hey, thank you. Have a good day.